Crypto is filled with many mysteries. However, here's the biggest one. Who the heck is Satoshi? My name is Guy, and today I've opened the Satoshi case files, and I want to share my findings on four key Satoshi suspects. All that is to help you come to a conclusion on who the elusive figure might be. I'm going to warn you now, my search for Satoshi includes one of the biggest criminals of our time, cypherpunks, and more. So, you definitely don't want to miss any of what I've unearthed. Before I get going, I need to cover my rear and say a few things. This crypto guy is not a financial advisor. Sorry to let you down there. That means that everything in this video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. With that flimflam out of the way, I want to welcome anyone bumbling onto my channel for the first time. Aloha and welcome to the Bureau. It's your home for the greatest reviews, news, and analysis to hit the blockchain. If you want to join this crypto journey, then grab your ticket right now by smashing that subscribe button. You may also want to hit that bell as well. Do that and my bosses at YouTube will let you know whenever I release another video. Oh, and some of you may have marveled at this t-shirt. That's because I am crypto's Clark Kent. In real life, my friends think I'm just a geek. But between these walls, I turn into super guy, saving you from all those fiat villains. In all seriousness, though, if you want to get your hands on this crypto merch, be sure to watch till the very end and I'll let you know how. And finally, only one thing is more valuable than Bitcoin, and that is your time. That's why, if you're strapped for time, I've provided these handy timestamps below. Use them to skip ahead to the sections you'll get the most value from. Now, this is going to be far from elementary, my dear Watson, but let's dive in. To kick things off, I want to explain why you should care who Satoshi is. Sure, it's nice to know who's behind one of the biggest innovations mankind has seen. However, there is a way more practical reason you should care about it. As you're watching this video, then chances are you hold some Bitcoin. And I guess you wouldn't be too pleased if the price of Bitcoin tanked. Well, although Satoshi's true holdings are unknown, Estimates place their Bitcoin stack at around 1 million BTC. That's about 5% of Bitcoin's entire circulating supply. That means those Bitcoins are worth a whopping $19 billion at the time of shooting this video. Now, I know mind-boggling numbers like this can be hard to place into context. So here's a fun fact. That $19 billion would make Satoshi the 95th richest person in the world, according to Forbes. So yes, imagine what would happen to the markets if all that Bitcoin was to theoretically hit the market. It would literally be crypto Armageddon. So that brings me on to another intriguing mystery. Why have none of these coins ever been moved? I mean, if I had $19 billion of Bitcoin, I'm sure I would have helped myself to a bit of it. Then there is the big question surrounding why Satoshi left Bitcoin. Satoshi's last communication was on April the 23rd, 2011, where they sent a brief email saying, I've moved on to other things, and that the future of Bitcoin was in good hands. Then, like a puff of smoke, the mysterious creator of Bitcoin just vanished and was never heard from again. Now, I mean, Satoshi is the founder of one of the most valuable payment systems the world has ever seen. Can you imagine the founder of Visa or a chap like Elon Musk leaving something this valuable and not taking any credit for their creation? It beggars belief. Now, the final thing I want to say here is that Satoshi was damn good at protecting his anonymity and went to great lengths to preserve it. Indeed, that's why the mystery still exists to this day. With that said, Shall we move on to our first suspect in our quest to find Satoshi? Our first suspect is Dorian Nakamoto, and he's a prime candidate if we're to believe that Satoshi Nakamoto isn't a pseudonym. Now I know what you're thinking. Dorian's first name is not Satoshi, so what gives here? Well, Dorian changed his birth name in 1973 to Dorian Prentice Satoshi Nakamoto according to the records filed with the U.S. District Court of Los Angeles. His birth name was actually Satoshi Nakamoto. I'll refer to him as Dorian throughout this video to help avoid confusion here. 
Now, Dorian remained under the radar until 2014, when an article by Leia Goodman was published by Newsweek declaring him to be the brains behind Bitcoin. So, aside from his name, what makes Dorian a candidate for being the real Satoshi? Well, let's look into his potential motivations for creating Bitcoin. To get into this, I do need to briefly explain Satoshi's outlook on the world. This is probably best summed up by Gavin Anderson, Bitcoin's chief scientist, who said that Satoshi, quote, doesn't like the system we have today and wanted a different one that would be more equal. He did not like the notion of banks and bankers getting wealthy just because they hold the keys. So, was there anything in Dorian's past that could lead him to hate banks? Well, according to his oldest daughter, Dorian was laid off twice in the 1990s, which led to him falling behind on mortgage payments and his taxes. The result of all that was that his family home was foreclosed. Now, that's when a homeowner falls behind on their mortgage or property payments and the bank effectively steals your house and sells it off to pay the debt. Put it this way, if I had my family home taken by a bank and sold, I would hate them even more than I do now. So, Dorian had a real motive to see that banking system burn. It also turns out that he holds libertarian values, as seen in Satoshi's communications. Evidence of that can be found in the interview that Leah Goodman had with Dorian's daughter. In it, she revealed how Dorian, quote, was very wary of the government taxes and people in charge. That deep suspicion of government was also highlighted by a new spin on the classic game of hide-and-seek. Dorian would kick that game off with his daughter by saying, pretend that government agencies are coming after you. Pretty libertarian stuff right there, if you ask me. So yes, it seems that Dorian had a motive and held the right values to be a match for Satoshi. But here's the $19 billion question. What other evidence is there to suggest that Dorian could be the man behind Bitcoin? The mystery of Satoshi has existed for over a decade, which means they were good at covering their tracks. Was Dorian capable of doing that? Well, according to his family, he has an obsession for privacy and was the type of chap who anonymized his emails for most of his life. So that appears to be a tick in that box. Now, the next question is if he had the technical know-how to create Bitcoin. Well, his past work experience included projects linked to defensive electronics and communications for the military. So, here we have a guy smart enough to work on classified military projects. A man whose given name was Satoshi Nakamoto, a guy who hated banks and was a libertarian. Here's the interesting thing. From 2001 onwards, Dorian's work history becomes fuzzy. He left his last stable job, and it's unclear what sort of work he undertook since then. Maybe he spent that lost decade working on a pretty damn important project called Bitcoin. The smoking gun is probably Dorian's response to Leah Goodman when he was asked about his involvement in Bitcoin. He's quoted as saying, I am no longer involved in that and I cannot discuss it. And it's been turned over to other people. They are in charge of it now. I no longer have any connection. So, case closed, right? We found Satoshi. Well, not exactly. Later, Dorian claimed that he misunderstood Goodman's questions and believed she was referring to a classified project he had worked on. He also claimed that quotes were taken completely out of context. Dorian later issued the statement right here. In it, he states that he did not create, invent, or work on Bitcoin. So, the jury is still out on whether Dorian is the real Satoshi. That transitions me nicely onto my next major Satoshi candidate. Hal Finney. So, let's take a look at him, shall we? Here's the deal. There is a glaringly obvious link between the late Hal Finney and Dorian Nakamoto. That would be that they lived only a few blocks away. Now, what are the chances that two of the prime candidates out of a very small Satoshi shortlist live a couple of blocks away? I'll get into this a little more later on. So, what about Hal's motivations for creating Bitcoin, and do they match up to publicly available information on Satoshi? Well, Hal was an old-school cypherpunk who popped up in the cypherpunk mailing list back in 1992. So what were these cypherpunk chaps all about? Well, Tim May lends some insight into this after attending a physical cypherpunk meeting in 1992, where he shared the crypto-anarchist manifesto. 
This basically said that technology was on the verge of enabling anonymous networks for messaging, conducting business, and the negotiation of electronic contracts without knowing the true name or legal identity of the other person. It goes on to say how these developments will completely alter the nature of government regulation, the ability to tax and control economic interactions, and the ability to keep information secret. So yes, those cypherpunk chaps were all about privacy, protecting civil liberties, and they were against the overreaching hand of government. The fact that Hal was a very active member of the cypherpunks seems to indicate that he bought into that ideology, which provides a motive to create something like Bitcoin and realize that vision. Here are a handful of fun facts. Notable cypherpunks also include the likes of Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, Graham Cohen, the creator of BitTorrent, Zuko Wilcox, founder of Zcash, and, of course, Hal Finney, a key contributor to PGP 2.0, the creator of reusable proof-of-work, the protocol on which Bitcoin was based. Now, what about the evidence pointing to Hal Finney being Satoshi? Well, remember that 1 million BTC that had never been touched? Now, maybe the legendary creator of Bitcoin really does have the discipline to not touch those funds. However, the other alternative is that they've sadly passed away. The last time Satoshi was heard from was in April 2011. Well, it turns out that Hal was diagnosed with ALS in 2009 and sadly passed away in 2014. Here in the UK, we call that motor neurone disease, which is a neurodegenerative neuromuscular disease. It all starts with weakness in the arms and legs, difficulty speaking or swallowing. This terrible disease then moves on to affect those muscles used for eating, speaking and walking. The loss in motor neuron function continues until the affected person is unable to breathe. So why am I bringing up this grim stuff? Well, Maybe the real reason that Satoshi left us forever in 2011 was that their health didn't allow them to continue working, and that the real reason that Satoshi's coins have not been moved is that Hal is no longer with us. To put some more meat on the bone here, you should know that Hal was the first employee of the PGP Corporation and worked there until his retirement in 2011. Yep, he retired because ALS meant he couldn't work anymore. And that's the same time that Satoshi vanished in a puff of smoke. So the dates seem to match up here. When it comes to having the technical skills to create Bitcoin, well, I mean, Hal was smart enough to build the protocol on which Bitcoin was based. So yes, he probably had it in him. That involvement in PGP could also explain Satoshi's hunger for anonymity. Seeing that Hal knew the problems that Phil Zimmerman had with the government when it came to PGP, with a technology like Bitcoin, it just would have been a smart move to preempt government interference. This wasn't Hal's first rodeo. Here's another interesting fact. After posting his white paper to the cypherpunk mailing list, Satoshi got a couple of replies. Who was one of the first? Yep, it was Hal Finney. Also, Finney was apparently the first person, aside from Satoshi, to start mining Bitcoin. He was also the first person to receive a BTC transaction. That's quite curious. I mean, doesn't it make sense that Satoshi tested the first ever Bitcoin transaction by sending it to themselves? And that leads me on to another major question. Just how interested was Hal in the idea of digital money? Well, it turns out that he contributed to a project in the early 1990s called Crash, short for Crypto Cash. That cool sounding name was shared by Hal to the cypherpunk mailing list. So here we have a chap who was looking into and trying to come up with brand names for crypto cash 15 years before the start of Bitcoin. Here's the thing though, for Hal to be Satoshi, we have to accept that he messaged himself from the very start of Bitcoin to cover his tracks. If you don't think that's likely, then you can rule Hal out as a Satoshi suspect straight away. Whatever the case, May you rest in peace, Hal. The crypto community will never forget your contribution to this space and the role you played to get crypto to where it is today. Here's yet another thing for you to think about. Is it simply too much of a coincidence that Dorian Nakamoto lived a couple of blocks away from Hal Finney? I mean, the USA is a big place and two prime candidates living in the same neighborhood? 
Now, this is a bit of conjecture, but if Hal isn't Satoshi, then he could well have told the real Satoshi about his neighbor, Dorian Nakamoto. That poor, retired guy that had his house foreclosed by those evil banks. Indeed, maybe Dorian was turned into a symbol to help us fight against everything wrong with the current financial system. Finally, for those that didn't know, Hal Finney's most famous tweet was made back at the start of 2009. It contained just two words, running Bitcoin. The fact remains that Satoshi went to great lengths to keep their identity a secret. Is it likely that the real Satoshi would make such a public statement about running Bitcoin? Or maybe it was an elaborate double bluff? With all that said, there's actually a fascinating potential link between Hal Finney and our next Satoshi candidate, Nick Sabo. In one interesting email sent to Hal Finney in 2009, Satoshi talks about customizing the first few characters to your name, a bit like a phone number that spells out something. The Bitcoin wallet address in the email has N and S as the first two letters. What's interesting is that the name Satoshi Nakamoto is a Japanese name, and in Japanese culture, the family name is traditionally written first. So, Satoshi Nakamoto would be written as Nakamoto Satoshi. So the initials for that would be NS. Maybe Finney was emailing himself to cover his tracks, knew about that cultural convention, and popped it in the email by accident. After all, the Bitcoin creator had perfect English, so it would be strange for a westernized person to start adhering to traditional Japanese naming conventions. However, others believe that NS stands for Nick Sabo. Let's move on to him, shall we? So, what motivations did Nick Sabo have to create Bitcoin? Well, Nick communicated regularly with the cypherpunks like Hal and Wei Dai. So, Nick hung out with the right crowd and must have shared many of their ideas and values. But who the heck is Wei Dai? Well, he was a University of Washington graduate who was studying computer science at around the same time as Nick Sabo. Dai was known for attempting to build a precursor of Bitcoin called B-Money back in 1998, the type of chap you might hang around with if you were Satoshi. But what evidence do we have to support the idea that Nick Sabo is Satoshi? Well, seriously, folks, this is incredible. Sabo had a personal blog, and in it he put forward the idea of miners who, quote, set their computers to solving computationally intensive mathematical puzzles in secure public registries giving them unique title to these provably scarce and securely time-stamped bits. He then goes on to explain the shortcomings of the current monetary system in his blog by saying, quote, The problem, in a nutshell, is that our money currently depends on trust in a third party for its value. As many inflationary and hyperinflationary episodes during the 20th century demonstrated, this is not an ideal state of affairs. Sounds quite a lot like Bitcoin, huh? Well, this proposal wasn't for Bitcoin, but for something similar called BitGold. The post cites Hal Finney's reusable proof-of-work system. However, there is one big problem, and that is that the post is dated 27th of December 2008, which is after Satoshi's white paper. Here's the interesting bit, though. Those that run a blog will know that you can change the publish date. Mohammed from mybloggertricks.com did a fascinating piece of investigative work showing that Nick Sabo's BitGold blog post was actually first published in December 2005, a few years before the Bitcoin white paper. In it, he shows how a permalink to the post verifies this earlier publishing date. That brings many questions. Why the heck was the date on the blog post changed? What was Nick trying to hide? Another fascinating thing is that there's publicly available correspondence between Satoshi and the likes of Hal Finney and nothing known between Satoshi and Nick Sabo. Maybe it's nothing, but whilst on the Tim Ferriss show, Sabo was asked about bigger blocks and second layer solutions. Nick replied, quote, I'd definitely go for a second layer. I mean, I designed Bitcoin gold with two layers. Now, possibly he misspoke, or it might have been a slip of the tongue. I'll let you decide if you think Nick Sabo is the most likely candidate for Satoshi or not. But that brings me on to my final suspect, who is a real-life Bond villain. Let's take a look at Paul LaRue, shall we? To understand why LaRue could have been motivated to create Bitcoin, I'll need to go into his backstory a bit. In short, 
He was a coder who ended up becoming one of the biggest criminal masterminds of our time, with a criminal network spanning half the globe. A key element of his business was an online pharmacy network called RX Limited. That little business generated hundreds of millions of euros in revenue every year through the sale of illegal prescription painkillers. Now, I imagine some of you know all too well about the opioid crisis of the mid-2000s that swept through the USA. Well, LaRue played a big role in supplying that demand through RX Limited. So, LaRue was making bank in the opioid markets, and that allowed him to diversify into other even more profitable ventures. That included the likes of smuggling methamphetamine out of North Korea, shipping cocaine to Australia, setting up arms deals in Indonesia, and the laundering of those ill-gotten gains using gold. So why the heck would a man like this want to invent Bitcoin? Well, I hate to say it, money laundering. But what about the evidence? First up, did LaRue have the technical know-how to invent Bitcoin? Well, he was a pretty insane coder by all accounts and fluent in a range of programming languages, but had a particular flair for C++, the programming language used to create Bitcoin. He was also credited with creating E4M in the late 1990s, which was a complex piece of disk encryption software. This was launched in 1999 and shared on a cryptography mailing list. This software actually had quite a few parallels with Bitcoin. In terms of other work showcasing that LaRue had the technical skill to create Bitcoin, Evan Ratliff, in an article on Wired, claimed he got a copy of LaRue's CV. That included years spent as a contract programmer, working on protocols for international bank transfer systems. Those banks included the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Here's the deal. From publicly available communications from Satoshi, it's pretty clear that philosophically they had a distrust of government control. They didn't like the banking system and wanted to create a new form of digital cash. LaRue and his criminal activities seem to all indicate that he thought in a very similar way. Now, LaRue was arrested in 2012 and sentenced for narcotics charges, seven murders, and operating a criminal cartel. Those types of charges naturally result in a lot of prison time. So maybe that explains why Satoshi's bitcoins have not been moved. LaRue simply cannot access them because he's in prison. Talk about LaRue being Satoshi flared up again recently after he informed a judge that he plans to start a business selling and hosting Bitcoin miners once he's released, making the claim that his ASIC chip design would be, quote, an order of magnitude faster at Bitcoin mining than any current design. So, is LaRue Satoshi? Well, there's actually a lot, lot more to this story. A topic for another video, perhaps. All right, team, that's about all I have time for today. However, I do want to share some closing thoughts. I'm the first to admit that the jury is still out on who exactly Satoshi is or was. However, there is another intriguing possibility. Satoshi is not a single person and is instead a group of developers. In terms of the risk of Satoshi suddenly moving all those bitcoins and dumping them on the market, well, that's not something I am personally all that worried about. After all, They've not been moved for 12 years, and I've seen no evidence to suggest that these coins will be hitting those exchanges anytime soon. Moreover, if they are moved, it could immediately tank the price and lead to massive uncertainty around the future of Bitcoin. Not something Satoshi would have wanted. So I actually view those coins as lost coins. So the real tradable supply of Bitcoin is 1 million fewer than what you see on coin market cap. Yes. BTC is even scarcer than you think. Okay, that's about all for this video, folks. But I do need to let you know about this sweet Bitcoin superhero t-shirt. I'm selling these in my official merchandise store, and you can get one by using the link in the description below. These t-shirts are only for people who want to support my work on YouTube and those who believe in the fight of good versus evil, Bitcoin versus the banks. And finally, if you found this video interesting, then help this crypto chap out and smash that like button and subscribe, or I'll unload those Satoshi coins. I bet you thought that was all. Well, I always leave the best for last. And because you guys made it to the end of that video, I have something to share. This is my weekly email newsletter. It's my way of succinctly crystallizing my views on the crypto market for the week ahead. 
Nowadays, I also share unique insights as well as juicy coin tips. So, keen to be a part? Well, you better check out the description where I've linked to a sign up form. All you need to do is enter your email address and hit submit. Be sure to confirm your address, and that's it. You're now locked, loaded, and ready to receive my next email. Oh, and it's weekly. I hate spam, and you won't be getting any from me.